Hi, Visa. Thanks for joining me. Hello. Thanks for having me. So I think um, I think really the core of the conversation I'm hoping to have is mm -hmm. um, really dive deeper into uh, who you are and what your ambitions are. I think it's easy to see for the, for people that follow you on Twitter to like see you as oh the guy that does the threads and um, talks about a lot of really cool stuff. But um, the more I am exposed to your stuff, the more I see a lot of long-term ambitions from you and mm -hmm. big, big goals and plans. And I want to get a better sense of what those are and how everything that you're doing fits into those. Um, cool. So um, maybe to start uh, sort of a big question, but would love to hear from you how you would describe your own story up to this point in broad strokes, whatever detail you want to share or, um, you know, level of granularity you want to give uh, long, short, it's all good. But just how would you describe your life up to this point? Right. So, you know, the thing about me is I, I tend to change my, not change, but I tend to tailor my answer to whoever I'm talking to or whatever the context is, not necessarily in a super deliberate way, but just, that itself, I think, is something that's quite telling about me. I try to be sensitive to what people want to hear or what. And again, you know, when you say what people want to hear, people tend to assume that you mean, uh, you know, kind of modifying or, or changing detail. But I, I mean, it's, it's not about changing details so much as it is identifying the beats that are resonant. But anyway, so just that kind of a general neutral-ish thing. Um I'm Visa, right? I'm born in 1990 in Singapore to my parents and uh, from, a, from a large family. Um, I have four brothers and a sister, if that's correct. Yeah. And um, what else? So I grew up in Singapore. So I'm ethnically Tamil, which is people from South India. And uh, my I went to school in Singapore, uh, grew up loving books, video games, libraries, I got to music a little bit later. So no one in my family was particularly musical. But when I was a teenager, there were people in school who played guitar and I fell in love with that. And then I got swept up in uh, my local music scene, which is beautiful for me. Uh, what else? And uh, so music, libraries, books. And uh, oh, so I, I was in... Uh, I, I don't really know what I want to focus on. Um so you mentioned that people know me from Twitter. So I think of Twitter as part of my, you know, so some people think of me as the Twitter guy or the guy who's always on Twitter, which I appreciate. You know, it's, it's, it's lately in the past several years, Twitter has grown to become a large part of my internet life. But I have always considered myself an internet native before that, bigger and broader than that. So like I used, I had, you know, I discovered forums when I was a kid, about seven or eight, nine years old. And I used to, like, video game forums. And uh, I, I was on, like, martial arts forums and stuff. I don't even know why. I was just I was just curious to explore, you know, because I loved books and libraries as a kid. And the internet, to me, felt like a, like a super library, a hyper library, where you can just write whatever you want. You can reply to people, right? Just in the broadest sense, you can connect with anybody anywhere and talk to anyone. Still blows my mind. And I still feel like people still don't entirely appreciate how powerful that is. Like, it's like, so imagine you're a kid and you're reading a book and the book just moves you, right? It's, it's something beautiful. Or you watch a movie, something just wonderful that somebody made. And, and some people might not even realize that everything that exists in the human realm was made by someone. Like even the computers that we're using, this microphone, right? Uh, the video software that we're using. Everything was made by somebody. People put together their time and attention and love. And I, I've, that has always just been a, a source of great um, awe for me. Like just kind of wonder and, and, and joy, like just to appreciate that. And uh, yeah, so on, online, uh, I used to have my own website. Like when I found the internet, I knew that I wanted to have my own personal home page. I wanted to be a webmaster, right? And uh, so I signed up for some website and, uh, some hosting provider where you could upload HTML files yourself. So I learned HTML from, I think I borrowed a book from the library, how to do HTML. Or I, I might have, I, I, before Google, there was like Yahoo, uh, 
yeah, whatever. I just searched, looked for stuff, just clicking around, trying to explore, trying to figure stuff out and made my own websites, you know, populated it with my favorite jokes and links and video games and stuff like that. And yeah, so I'm just kind of continuing on that journey broadly, I would say. I mean, so there's a, there's tons of other stuff I could talk about, but like that I feel is the, it's kind of the main thing that I would condense as the central thread. And you know, I might meet someone else who doesn't know anything about Twitter and maybe they know me from local music and I'll be like, oh, let me tell you about the story of music and then, you know, how I play in a band and how I organize gigs and, and you know, listen to whatever music, whatever. But yeah, I, I think the the biggest, grandest vision is what I describe as um, the, the library ethos, which is, you know, uh, I sometimes describe libraries as cathedrals to the light of human consciousness, right? Libraries are one of the things that civilization has gotten really, really right, like public libraries. Anywhere in the world, in most countries, probably all, you can go to a library, there are books there that you can, you can, first of all, like it's a public space that you can enter and not be expected to buy anything, right? So it's not consumery. It's like, you know, it's it's sacred to me. It really is. Like, even though it's secular or whatever, it's just, it's, it's like the fact that libraries exist make me want to be a good person in the world. Like, as opposed to being like, you know, kind of a selfish and, and protective and needy and that kind of thing. Like, I, I live in a world where libraries exist and street musicians. And, and as long as these people and these processes ex- exist, I want to s- be a part of that. I want to be a librarian in, in this. I want to embody the spirit of a librarian. So even if I don't actually run my own library, like it's just, you know, involving people in the process, having stuff that you can share with other people, um, in, in every sense. So you could think of my Twitter threads or my web of my web of Twitter threads as as a kind of library. You could think of the people that I build relationships with. And you know, a library is not just the books, right? A library is an institution, right? It's a if you think about the Baghdad House of Wisdom or the Library of Alexandria or whatever. Like you need scholars, you know, you need people doing doing the study, people educating children, right? It's, it's just it's a whole thing. And um, yeah, so you know, it's it starts in the smallest level of my mom bringing me to the library to read books, and me sitting at home as a kid on the floor reading books, to me tweeting like crazy, and mm-hmm. just today I was tweeting tweeting about like how you know my semi jokey, semi serious meme is like I want to rebuild the Baghdad House of Wisdom, and again, it doesn't necessarily have to be tied to a specific location. It doesn't need to be a, a place, a building, right? It's it's a network of relationships and and how people relate to each other and how people relate to knowledge and what we care about and how we, you know, make sense of the world and, and pass that on to other people. Like, yeah, that's, that's what I do. Like, you know, at at the moment, you know, right now I have, when I talked about this with some friends, you know, when I was 20, 21 and I had, ah, 21, Twitter didn't even exist yet. Twitter was, hey, wait, no, Twitter came, Twitter was 2007. So I I did have a Twitter account, but like I had maybe, I don't know, 100 followers who were all my friends who hardly log on, right? So, back, but even then, I, I, you know, I had, in 2010, I had this dream for this project I called the Legion of Heroes project, which was inspired by like video games, I think. Like I was playing video games and maybe reading about like uh, Ben Franklin and Carl Sagan and all these people. And just this idea of uh, wanting to assemble some kind of crew, wanting to put together a group of people, just great people who are curious, ambitious in some way. Like I didn't know how exactly that was going to turn out, but I just, you know, who are who are heroic people in in that I can associate with? And, you know, the, the bigger my audience gets, the more I become sensitive to how anything that I want to talk about could have some negative connotation to it. So, like, when I say hero, some people might think, oh, it's it's some selfish person who wants glory and what like I don't know, that's not what I mean. I mean it's just a just a person who takes heroic action, right? A person who's brave, um, inspiring, who just the way that they conduct them. You can be any kind of hero. You can be a teacher, you can be a nurse, a doctor, mom. Like there's there's many ways to be heroic. And some people uh you know, it just it's a it's kind of an a, a, a observable reality that some people are more heroic than others and i don't i don't judge people for being more or less than but i do know that i i personally think it would be beautiful to see more of that like just that that ephemeral whatever it is you know whether it's if have if you could assemble a group of heroic um songwriters right who are going to write beautiful melodies that move people i want to see that 
or if you want to have a bunch of heroic uh, gardeners, right, who want to make beautiful gardens for people to rest in. I want to see, my, just whatever it is, right? It's just ambition in that heroic, beautiful, nurturing sense. Uh, I couldn't have articulated it back then, but that was what I wanted. And I tried. I would go around talking to my friends and try. And, you know, back then I was more pushy about it because I was a teenager and like, like I didn't I wasn't as sensitive to other people's feelings so I was kind of beating people over the head with it like ah why aren't we not more ambitious why are we not more and some people are like we said you need to chill man like you're really you're, you're, you're kind of do it like it's too much and they were right you know they were right and I had to learn I had to learn to temper my intensity and listen to people I did spend a few years kind of like oh shit I am I talk over people a lot right I uh I used to not listen to people closely. Like I would, I used to be this kind of argumentative. You know, I've read a lot of books, so I feel like I know a lot of stuff. So if I'm having a conversation with someone and they don't seem to be sure about what they're saying, I used to kind of butt in and try to make their point for them. And now I realize that oh, you know, like you should give people the space to articulate themselves, even if they're not doing it amazingly well yet, so that they can nourish and grow. Like, like it's all these things that I've learned along the way. But I will say that you know, from the very start. Um, you know, like so I, I once wrote a blog post when I was about twenty. It was very arrogant. It was titled "How to Save Singapore," which is my country, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. it was very oh, you know, like I was like I I, I was like nineteen maybe, and I wrote like a look at the state of our media, look at the state of our culture. We don't even support our local sports teams or our local um you know music scenes and like it's so boring and stale and i bet that we can fix this and we just need to do this and do that and like i got i got smashed in the comments like every like my own friends and strangers they all said you're you're being a presumptuous little prick you know you have no idea what the fuck you're talking about you're a child you have no you have no experience in the real world you don't understand why people are doing what they're doing just all kinds of criticisms and it was all correct it was all you know uh people were brutal but there was stuff to be learned and the thing that to me it didn't seem remarkable but like the thing that when i talk to more people i realize for some reason it's a way in which i seem to be different than other people when i received all of that um pushback right at no point did i think huh i'm not cut out for this this is bad i suck i should stop I did not think that at all. I just thought, huh, okay. Here's a, like clearly I am not being received in the way that I intend. And so I need to learn what I did wrong and change it so that I can, you know, um do what I want. Because I, I do believe that my observations were correct. And I went I went back and read the post again recently, and I'm like, you know, he I I wasn't wrong in in what I was trying to express, but my language was clunky. I didn't know how to be sensitive to people. I was being presumptuous, but there is there was a lot of value in what I was saying, in my opinion. I, I think it's true. And um, all of the criticisms that people had was useful to me. And I integrated all of that into my understanding. And so I've learned that, okay, you have to respect other people's autonomy. You can't force people to change before they want to change. You can't demand make demands of people. You can't modify behavior by scolding people. Or right? you have to invite them to something exciting and interesting. Like... Every single thing that I'm good at, I was likely once bad at it and somebody pointed out that I'm doing a bad job and I'm like, all right, I'm going to try and fix it. And so even now, like even now you will find people on Twitter who are like, oh, you know, Visa hasn't accomplished this or Visa hasn't blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. You know, I th- that's you know, like all like any criticism that anybody has of me, I bet it's probably correct in some way. And I'm willing to accept that. And like I'm willing to integrate that into the long game that I'm playing because libraries take decades to build. You know, I don't expect to be done next year. You know, this is a lifelong thing, and apparently that's not very common a <laughs> perspective. And um, I've had a bunch of people who come to me years after such a confrontation at some point, and they're like, "Oh, you know, years ago, like in 2007 or in 2012 or in 2016, uh, we had an argument and." Uh, I thought you were full of shit, but I see that you're still doing what you said you're gonna do. So I guess you're for real. I'm like, yeah, dude. <laughs> you know, I, I I live my life like this. I I understand. I, so there was a period of time where I used to get mad why people don't seem to see me for what I am, and now I realize like, oh, okay. Like there are a lot of lurid examples of people who do who say shit they don't mean and they act in bad faith. And people, you know, it's called the lemon problem in in like used car markets, like. 
you have to assume that any used car is probably bad because if it was good, it would be sold already. And so like the assumption is that any car, the moment it goes on the secondhand market, you should just assume that it's shitty and like um, the price drops tremendously because it's just the assumption is that there must be something wrong with it. So even if, if, if you are trying to sell a secondhand car that's perfectly fine, you still have to deal with the lemon problem and so you have the, that people are going to make assumptions about you. And yeah, so I kind of, I meditate on that, reflect on that. I'm like, okay, this is the, and you know, you read history and you find out that, you know, like Martin Luther of the Protestant Reformation, like his opponents like called his mother a whore and a buff attendant. Like, you know, like people just attack anyone who's trying to do anything. And you know, the thing is not to take it too personally and not to, and not even, and you know, there's also, there's a way of not taking it personally in a very performative way where you're still taking it personally you're just kind of pretending that you're not which is also you know it's like there, there is a deeper underlying kind of humor to the thing and it's i don't know i'm just kind of rambling at this point but hmm. yeah you know libraries trying to do better trying to help people trying to bring people together um at whatever scale is afforded to me. So when I was starting out, it was small. It has gotten bigger. I would like to do this at the biggest possible scale I can manage, but I am not going to, you know, defer or compromise what I can do now for the remote chance of something big in the future, right? So it's like, how do I... So I joked earlier that I want to rebuild the Baghdad House of Wisdom. And, you know, I would say that in a sense, me and my friends, including you, we are already kind of embodying its spirit, like its spiritual successor is with us on Twitter and, you know, in the conversations that we have off Twitter or wherever, it's just, it's, it's a bunch of people coming together to discuss ideas and to try and put forward, you know, um, one of the quotes that Al Mamun said, I think, was that we want to serve the whole world, right? They did that in, in the 600s, 800s, they were trying to serve the whole world. And like, you know, that is a, a, a lineage that I am proud to be a part of. I think if you read books and you write and you talk to people, like you are a part of that, that heritage, right? Of the keepers of the flame of the light of human consciousness. And uh, yeah, I, 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 it gives me a lot of satisfaction and pride to participate in this process. And, you know, sometimes I get DMs from guys, especially young guys who say they, and like the way I would summarize what they, what they're troubled with is that they are spiritually homeless. That's I kind of like, I don't know if like multiple people said that or it's like one or two guys said it and it just really stuck with me. But like this idea of being spiritually homeless and they talk about it in relation to, you know, not having church or not having, you know, not being religious, not maybe like their fam, their parents are divorced or something. Like they just feel like life is kind of, eh, there's no authority, like authorities are illegitimate and there's no order. It's all chaos. I'm like, eh, you know, kind of, yeah, I see where you're coming from. But like, you know, there's, there is... Uh, you know, there's there's this idea of uh, I don't know where exactly I got this from. It might be Khalil Gibran, it might be some Sufi poet or something. But it's this idea of um, of of the the, the ch- church in the wild, sort of right, like the 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 gods of the wild, like as opposed to I think Alan Watts had some bits about this as well. He's like, you know, there's there's the men of the cloth, right? The the, the priests who are ordained in some order that has been going like you you get your spiritual awakening from a teacher who guides you through a process and you have to go through the instructions and whatnot and then there is the personal private revelation that people tend to have they seem to go on pilgrimages and they have it like in the desert or in the forest or in the jungle you know they go somewhere and they're isolated and alone and uh, joseph campbell talks about this he's like you know where we seek to be alone by ourselves we find we find that we are with all the world like yeah there, there is i have had some version of that experience and you know just the sense of communion with all beings and all people all objects all like uh you know so the the, the king is dead long live the king right like it's it's um the thing that I try to convey to the young to guys is that, and, and girls as well, you know, it's just just thinking about the people who show up. But like, um, is that you can you don't need to go somewhere to have a spiritual awakening. In my opinion, you can. And I mean, it can help. It can help to have like a, a you know like a ritual or a ceremony or something that that kind of kickstarts the process for you. But the reality of it, in my understanding, is that you can have a spiritual awakening in your present moment, wherever you are in your life, 
by perceiving the ways in which you are not isolated, not alienated, not alone, not homeless. Like no one is homeless on the planet. You know, I mean, I mean, and this is not a commentary on like uh, housing. Right? I mean, I mean, in terms like spiritually, no one is spiritually homeless on the planet because we are we are we belong here. This is where we're from, right? We are off the earth, and like just and I mean that like in a in a span of thousands of years, tens, millions of years even, right? Like the atoms that we're from, you know, from Neil Tyson has his riff about how the, the heavy the heavy chemicals that our atoms constitute were cooked in stars, right? Like stars that went supernova, that became condensed and then went supernova and then they scattered their enriched guts, he says, um, across, the, across space. And then those become planets and then that creates carbon and all the atoms that we need to make life. And so we are at home, not just on Earth, but in the universe. Right? We are all family. We are all the Big Bang still happening. Right? It's, it, it's all one. And when you really see that and you really feel that, you realize that we are all one family right? in a very real sense. And, and then there's culture, there's language. If you're speaking English or any language that you speak, you didn't invent that. Your, and your teachers didn't invent that. It's an ongoing collaborative process that's been going on for thousands of years. So just by speaking, you are already participating in a grand tradition. Just, don't, just you know, you don't really, nobody really sits you down and, and introduces you to, hey, let's teach you about English. You just use it, you just speak it. And, you, and yeah, it's just seeing all of that and then realizing that, you know, when you play music or you go to the gym, just anything that you do is a spirit it can be a spiritual practice and it can be something that you share with other people you can teach someone else you can learn from someone else you can you know find community in that and if you can find community you can find communion in that and there is a spirituality in that and it's just ah uh, it's like i i don't i know maybe i'm just really lucky that i've never really had like um uh, to I mean, I've I've had my crisis moments, but they were so long ago, and so uh, they feel like they feel like a different life, like a lifetime ago, in a sense. And so it's it it's challenging for me to inhabit that state again. I probably can if I try very hard and I kind of read my old notes and stuff. But um, I now feel like it's there are things to me that are so obviously good and right and valuable and people can feel it just being around me and it's you know it's not even like i want to personally give people good feelings or whatever but like you know the it's like uh let's frame it like this i was a lonely kid like you know i was a nerd and uh just as a weirdo misfit dark skin strange name and so i was a lonely kid and i did and i wanted to not be lonely and you know when we met in 2019 right it was my internet friends who flew me out to, to San Francisco and people offered to host me in their homes. People fed me. People took care of me, made sure that I was okay, you know, like a, put me in an Uber to go to the next destination, walked me from here to there. Like it was just, they made me feel extremely at home, right? And, I, and now that I think about it, I remember feeling, uh, I remember feeling not that. I remember feeling like my life didn't matter. Like people didn't care about me. Like it wouldn't matter if I would live or die. Like even you know, like oh yeah, your, your parents will be sad. Like yeah, for a while. You, know, and then you mean go, as a like, kid I, before you were in the bay? Bef- I mean, now I'm thinking about when I was a teenager. I think I think my yeah, alienation right. was was most acute twice. Once when I was about seventeen, and once when I was about twenty five. Those were my two most intense like depressions, dark night of the soul kind of thing. Where it, yeah, it just felt like life is an ordeal rather than an adventure. It just feels like it's like a jail sentence, right? It's like a even if you have a job that you kind of like and and a family that you kind of love and like all those things. It just I remember now, it, yeah, it it felt like a jail sentence. It like just with extra steps, right? Like yeah, you can you can go wherever you want allegedly, but you know you still have bills to pay, you have a mortgage to pay, you have all these obligations, blah blah blah. And even even now when I'm framing it that way, I don't know if that's the the that captures the full essence of how dark and bleak it got. But having experienced, you know, the sunshine of kinship and friendship and, and belonging, I'm like, uh, you know, I, I don't believe that I'm so, you know, rarefied, special, magical human being that I'm above other people or whatever, that what I have been given is only for me. You know, it's, it has to be, 
something that must be accessible to a lot of people. Like, I mean, I, I don't know if it's immediately accessible to everyone, but it's definitely accessible to a lot of people other than me. And so I see it as my, you know, again, like when I say duty, that might be a load of it for some people where they feel like duty seems like an obligation, like a non-obligatory invitation. My, my invitation, right? The invitation that the universe has sent me that I, I how, how I'm choosing to receive it is to give the gift of kinship to every lonely being, right? Like sort of like, and again, there's, there's a project management aspect to that. Like I can't, if I could snap my fingers and have everybody on the on earth have it in an instant, I would, but that's not really feasible. So I am looking, I'm, so I'm looking for a crew, right? Like I mentioned earlier, the Legion of Heroes, I'm looking for a crew. I'm assembling people who I think are qualified, you know, friendly, ambitious nerds, right? People who have, who have some of the traits that they need and maybe they need some help polishing certain other aspects so that they can each be leaders in their communities and they can each kind of be their own chapter, their own wing of, of, and you know, I'm, I'm not looking for, for to make money. I'm not looking to get uh, some kind of glory for some specific um, altar. I'm like non-denominational and just however you want to do it. I don't care. You know, I, I'm very, very agnostic about what people, how people choose to, like if you, if you look at it, one, one way I try to approach this is you look at a list of things that you Google, like, how do I know if I'm a cult, if I am in a cult? And they'll tell you like, oh, there's one leader and he cannot be questioned. I'm like, okay, so let's not have leaders and let's question everything. And then they'll be like, you have to you have to give up your friendships and your family. You have to leave your family and friends and go somewhere else. I'm like, okay, no, like, let's not do that. Let's make sure that everybody involved is, nobody is allowed to be here full time. Like everybody should be in their own lives and taking care of business, taking care of their families, blah, blah, blah. And like, yeah, just well-integrated, well-developed people who uh, have a lot of autonomy, a lot of freedom, a lot of courage to do whatever they want, whatever they think is best. And yeah, you know, I think if we have like a million people like that in the world, like we will need those people to help us navigate the challenges that are inevitably coming in in our collective future. Yeah. That's <laughs> so right. That is uh, uh, I, a rambling narrative of my life, but yeah, any thoughts? Well, um, yeah, many thoughts. Uh, I suspect we'll come back to some of the points that you made, but I think the, the best thing to maybe zoom in to that you didn't mention explicitly, but we've talked about before is, um, you know, people that watch my show will have, known that I talked to your mentor, Dinesh, a while ago. Oh, right, yeah. And uh, I would be really curious to hear about your relationship with him and the mentorship that you received from him, because right. uh, he's an interesting character. And I suspect that he, from what I know of what you've said, that he, he played a pretty pivotal role in making it possible for you to actualize this vision. And so I'd be curious to hear like what that relationship was like for you and, and what you worked on with him. Um, not, not, not so much like practically in, in the company, but like in terms of the mentorship relationship that you had with him. Right. So yeah, Dinesh, Dinesh is the love of my life, man. He's like, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I feel like there are two ways in which I have, well, maybe multiple ways, but two ways in which I have been ridiculously lucky. And is that one is that I met my wife when we were like 10 years old and, and you know, we're happily married all nine years now. And mm -hmm. the other thing is that my first job out of military was uh, with working for Dinesh, who was like, you know, about as perfect, in my opinion, as, as a boss can be. Like, and, from, and again, you know, there's one of those things where I don't know how much of how everything in my life seems so perfect is a function of me being really lucky or me being really good at seeing the beauty and perfection in the things that, uh, gifted to me, right? Like, it's, it's, you know, it's like what you choose to focus on, right? But anyway, uh, so Dinesh found me through my blog. So when I was in the military, when I was a teenager, I had a website and uh, I was just posting whatever I wanted. And like I mentioned earlier, I had that How to Save Singapore post and that went kind of viral locally before Facebook and Twitter were like much, but like blog posts were being emailed around and stuff. And so that got a bunch of attention. And so I became like a political slash social commentary blogger kind of guy. And uh, I got better and better at that. And eventually one day I got invited to meet the prime minister of Singapore. Not by myself. It was like a, he wanted to meet a group of bloggers. And I met him and I wrote a blog post about that. And that post went about even more viral than any of my previous posts. And Dinesh read that post. 
and he liked how I thought. He he thought that I was quite um, measured and thoughtful in my analysis, and he invited me to meet for coffee. I didn't even realize that he was. It was like a hiring call. I thought because you know I didn't. I I knew about software as a kid. Like again, I used to make HTML and stuff. But when I tried CSS, uh, JavaScript, and C plus plus, I'm like ah. I I wasn't and the 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 juice was not worth the squeeze for me, so I didn't really get super deep into software. Uh, and so Dinesh emailed me in around I think December of 2012 to ask me out for coffee with the intent of of kind of pitching that I work for his company um, to run the blog. So this is it was as simple as it's like an early stage company. Um, it's like five or six software engineers working on the product. The product already had product market fit, so they had customers. They already raised funding, so it's like pretty much an ideal context for someone's first job. I feel like you know, it's like it's a small. If again, I, I'm I'm always going to describe things as though they're ideal, even though I don't know if maybe they're not. But like it, it was very ideal for me. Small group, small group of people, so the entire office can fit in the car to go out for for lunch, which is what we did. And you know, you can hear everything that's going on in the company, so you have you develop an understanding of business in that holistic sense. And um, I was like the only, there's one marketing intern and then I was like the first marketing hire. So I got a lot of freedom to do whatever I wanted, whatever I thought was right. And, uh, you know, a lot of learning, a lot of experimentation, um, super smart colleagues. So I was like learning so much from them every day, just at lunch. And uh, the thing that I really got, so even if, even if Dinesh was like, an average boss, I think I would have still enjoyed working at doing software content marketing because it's writing. So I, was, I learned my, I, it made me a better salesman, better, well, not better marketer specifically. So sales, sales and marketing is a distinction. Sales is about asking for the money, which I'm actually not that great at yet. I'm like a, I'm like a B minus market uh, salesperson and like an A plus marketing guy. That's how I would describe myself. And, um, but, you know, like learning to get people's attention, learning to get people's interest, learning to write in a more, um, condensed way i think i think marketing teaches you to write in a very uh user focused reader focused user focused kind of way like so very often you you see most most marketing gets dismissed as kind of a you know so, so there's, there's a selection bias effect most people's discussion about marketing focuses on bad marketing which is when there's someone just did a bad job and then like a sloppy job and then you're like ah it's, you know how do these fools think that marketing works at all but like when marketing is done well, you know, it's scary, actually. It's like, you know, like big oil use their PR and marketing power to convince people to think about personal carbon footprints, which, you know, directs people's attention away from corporate carbon footprints into like, it's just understanding human psychology and understanding how people talk to each other. And like to some degree, I got into marketing because I was afraid of marketing as in, in terms of the power that it has over humans. And so I didn't want to let that kind of, um, you know, I wanted to understand these powerful forces in the world so that I could resist them to some degree. And I think that works. Uh, but anyway, so Dinesh hired me to help grow the content marketing team, help to build out the content features and, and the blog and all of those things. And uh, so there's a bunch of interesting technical stuff but I mean, I think what you want to hear and what is what is probably most more interesting to a lot of people is that he was a great mentor figure. He was like he was basically my therapist, and he paid me, you know. And he he was a, he was a therapist. He paid me, and he had a personal stake in witnessing my performance get better, right? So, and I I think the the issue with uh, therapy sometimes that some people mention is that your therapist only just gets paid for you to show up. So they only need to care if you show up. And if you show up every day for every week, for months, for years, and you don't make any progress, as long as you keep showing up, it doesn't really affect them, right? Like it's like the incentives are not aligned. Whereas in Dinesh's case, because he's my CEO, he's my boss, he wants to get more out of me if he can. And uh, so he wants, so if if the bottleneck of my performance at work is my personal issues, and I, and I think everybody's bottleneck at work is personal issues, like, it's very rare. If it's very rarely you lack knowledge or you lack, you know, like those simple thing, those simple things can be addressed pretty easily. It's usually personal, personal issues that are the bottleneck of people's performance. And uh, so he would, 
we would do a one-on-one every in, in the early days it was every two weeks and when the company grew larger it was once a month and uh, he would just so we would have a document like we would bring our laptops and we would go out for coffee or something and we would just have a discussion about you know what were your priorities this week we, we had a format but i don't know if the format is necessarily super anything magical about the format it's kind of straightforward like if you google um andy grove you know Sorry, uh, Ben Horowitz from Anderson Horowitz. If you Google Ben Horowitz one on ones, like one dash on dash ones, uh, you will find like a framework for having one on one meetings. But again, the thing about one on one meeting is, it's really about the the vibe of the person you are doing it with. It's it's a two way thing, right? And both people have to have to be mutually invested in having a productive meeting and having you know like working through issues together and Dinesh was just really really good at being persistently curious about whatever issues I was going through and you know I was very willing to be honest with Dinesh about whatever I was going through which I suspect might not have been as true for I don't. I don't know how true that would have been for everybody else in the company. Although I do think Dinesh probably inspired some level of uh, intimate sharing from other people. So you you do see uh, Cedric also describes his one on ones with Dinesh. Uh, Darren also describes his one on one with Dinesh. My other friend, my other ex colleague Desmond. So there are multiple people who had pretty intimate one on ones with Dinesh, and you know, so he he does have that skill of 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 persuading people that he genuinely cares about their well-being and their their development right i remember i think in your interview your chat with him you said something like you are willing to walk a very long path with your people and he said something like uh you know if you're serious about helping that's the only way to do it like that's what he said mm-hmm. and it's true it's like you just sense that here is a man who's genuinely curious to understand you and he's not looking to judge you, which is like insane. Like people go to therapists and say that their therapist was being judgy towards them, right? Like it's it's choosing to remain non-judgmental. Like he's a, you know, I, I it's funny that I'm saying this to you, but I've said this to other people that Dinesh is like a Zen monk robot, like sort of like, you know, he's just, he's so genuinely curious. And so I remember... The first couple of times we had slightly more uncomfortable conversations were like, I was late for a meeting. A couple, I think I was late for more than one meeting. And he asked me casually, but like, you know, pointedly, like, hey, why were you late? And I, you know, my instinct is, oh, fuck. You know, when, like, I, I think back to the last times I've been late for something, or I'm being scolded for something. Like, I associated that question, like, why did you do X with, oh, it's time for me to perform my my penitence it's time for me to demonstrate my my you know like deference to you know it's like my parents or my teachers are scolding me for doing something wrong and they don't really care they just want to see you grovel so i'm like oh it's time to grovel now so i'm like oh you know i'm so sorry i did did, yesterday i was he's like no no no. i i i don't i don't i don't need you to say that i I just want to understand i just want to understand i want to understand why you were late i'm like I I had moment like multiple moments over the years with Dinesh, multiple one on ones. There would be these moments where I would assume that he wants to hear something that most other people I assume would want to hear, and he's like, "No, I don't want to know that. That's fine. I like I want to know what. Why were you late?" And when you're not allowed to grovel, you then have to think, and it like it blew my own mind to realize that I had gotten so much in the habit of groveling that I had stopped inquiring myself about my own, the co- the true causes of my own behavior. So at the point in time where we were having one-on-ones, Dinesh was more curious about me than I was curious about myself. And like just making sense of that was a mind fuck for me. I was like, holy shit. And you know, so I'm like, okay, we are in new territory. I've never been here before. Let me try. Um, I must have been late. Well, let's tra- then he's like he's like, no, trace back the cause and effect events. Like, like, you know, it's not about you as a as a moral being. Like, I just want to know what happened and where can we intervene. And he's like, uh, and I'm I'm like, okay, I'm late because I, I woke up late. It's like, okay, so, so why did you wake up late? Like, did you not set an alarm? I'm like, like, no, I don't I don't respond to alarms because I'm just I'm a heavy sleeper. And uh 
you know, I slept late. It's like, oh, why do you sleep late? Uh, I was playing video games, I guess. Like, he's like, oh, why, why? So what's what's the story there? Like, why? And I'm like, you know, it's like, is this the part where I I perform groveling and shame that I play video games? He's like, no, no, you know, like, so how how do you think? How do you think about your video game? Uh, habit like you know how much do you play why do you why, why do you play it how often do you play how many hours what do you think is reasonable and like that felt alien to me at the time to think about my video game playing as something that i could think about like because at the time now i can say with the clarity of of hindsight that would have been like my child self or my whatever self, you know, desperately trying to squeeze in some sense of fun, some sense of autonomy away from like my disciplinarian authoritarian self trying to do work. And so, you know, so I, I was at the time ashamed of the fact that I was playing video games at all. Like just because, because that was a, and you know, you hear similar things to people talking about alcoholism or binge eating, you know, like, oh, I ate the whole ice cream. Like, so you, you, you can imagine if someone's binge eating and they talk to Dinesh and be like, oh, Dinesh would be like, oh, you know, how do you think about the ice cream that you eat? Like, and, and he says it with genuine curiosity and it's just so, so neutral and blank. You're like, you're really asking me that. You're really asking me why I ate two tubs of ice cream. He's like, yeah, I want to know. You know, like he genuinely wants to know. He's like, a, he's he's almost like a child, like in in the way that he brings his curiosity to the table. And then you have to ask, like how you know? It's like say, so if a child asks, you know, like how do you explain it to a child? Like he doesn't have the context, so you have to you have to really rethink all your assumptions. And yeah, so we had a lot of that. He got me to to examine the dynamics of my relationship with myself and uh, my priorities. You know, he had all these phrases. He was like, uh, he would ask, you know, what are you trying to do here? How are you going to measure your progress? Um, you know, what's, the, what's the biggest obstacle stopping you from getting what you want? And he, he would just ask these things so casually, so persistently. My friend, so my friend Damien was working one floor downstairs from us. And um, he was working as a barista in the cafe. And he told me how Dinesh once came to collect his coffee. And Damien was just casually kind of ranting. He's like, ah, oh, I wish I could do this thing. And then Dinesh just turned to him and he was like, oh, what's stopping you? And Damien, my friend Damien, he told me that he spent all day that day thinking about that question. I mean, the, the question, the words of the question is, what's stopping you, right? But like, people can say that in a throwaway, way, throwaway sense. But the way Dinesh asks you these questions is very he has this this sense of of genuine possibility what's stopping you like really like you know like why are you not doing the thing that you say you want to do and it throws people off because people make utterances socially right it's just ah oh, i wish i could do that you know like, ah. it's, it's just kind of you're just saying words but to dinesh words have to mean something like he's very he's very precise about his choices of words and he really wants to be, he's a program. He's like an engineer programmer guy, and he's just very pres- intense about being honest and truthful and understanding what you're saying and so on. And yeah, so you know, just just exp- I sat next to him for five and a half years, and so he, you know, I, I, I have integrated like a Dinesh module into my head, and it's like very, it's be precise, be methodical, figure out what you're trying to say ask people questions, you know, um, there's no point beating yourself up for anything. Like just figure out what the real problem is, figuring out what the, you know, what are, what are the next steps? Like all of those things, like it's just from witnessing him do it. And he was great at like, um, he was just really mature. He was like an adult, you know, he was, he was the first, you know, like compared to, I, I thought he was more adult than like uh, my parents or my teachers. Or, he was the first, person i met in real life that i could sit next to and turn to and ask questions who i really respected and admired like really i, I felt like here's a you know and he's a guy i felt like he's, he's like this big brother slash this this masculine ideal that i aspired towards you know he was he i sometimes joke with my wife that he is he was like the daddy bird of the company like and and that's that's a riff from david ogilvy so david ogilvy was talking about how as CEO of uh, Ogilvy Copywriting Services, whatever, uh, you know, he had to provide for his entire company, right? He had to bring in contracts, he had to bring in opportunities so that they could get paid, so that they can feed their families. And there is 
you know, that is king energy, right? Like it's really just kind of uh, taking responsibility for taking care of other people. And Dinesh did that and he never complained. He never, he was always professional. He's, he's just really, I, even like, on, you know, on his wedding day, we tried to get him drunk and he did get drunk and he was still, you know, he's still Dinesh. It's just, you're kind of hoping that you'll see some like alien, you know, different, well, I mean, so he he can he can get passionate talking about education. You know, again, like there's there's nothing I can say about Dinesh that isn't positive, really. Like, uh, it's he's just, I mean, like you know, you you, you might like you might say he's kind of. Some people might say he's kind of boring, but like he knows that he knows who he is. He's he he finds himself he finds the things that he does endlessly interesting. He's a he's a guy who really. You know he's doing what he knows he should be doing, and it's beautiful. It's, it's just the sense of of um, confidence that is grounded in knowledge and experience, rather than like bluster and and bravado. Like he had no need to ever brag about anything. He never, you know, um, he never really cared about credit. You know, he never like I would have to tell him, hey, you should do more. Like you should go and give talks and stuff. You know, you should go on interviews. He's like, nah, that's not. I mean. Not he's he, you know he, I think he would have told you that in his chat as well. He's like an engineering guy, so he doesn't really have a a sense of occasion. He doesn't really have a he doesn't have that that showmanship flair. Um, like it doesn't come naturally to him. He has to train for that where necessary in his role as CEO. But uh, but yeah, he's great, man. I love him. He's I he has my heart forever. Like I I still have one on ones with him like every, roughly at least at least a couple of times a year. And I I I. I you know, I never want to waste his time. Even now, even after I no longer work for him, I'm like, I want to finish my book so that when I ask him for our next one-on-one, I will have interesting information to present to him, right? So that mm. we can have a good time. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, one of the things I took away from that conversation, it seems like um, obviously you can't reduce his like MO to a formula, but one of the things that I learn from him that he does is kind of get a sense of people's long-term goals and then mm-hmm. see how they're executing that in the yeah. short term. And um, yeah, I guess that could be sort of a bridge to, you know, something I'd like to ask you about, about like, we've talked a bit about your long-term goal of like libraries and heroes and kind of giving back to the culture that you come from and like this, the times that we find ourselves in. And um, given that, like, I guess um, I can I can guess at how the different things that you're doing fit into that, but I'd be curious to hear how you would describe that. Of like, um, you know, you're writing books and how the books fit in, or like how your threads fit in, or the videos that you're making, or a- anything else that you happen to be doing. Like your grant, you're working on this grant that you're offering to people. How does that all fit into the long term vision as you see it right now? Mm. I mean, so I don't have a fixed central sure. plan or some kind of sure. yeah so it's just it's really just i do everything that i think is interesting and exciting and uh, you know it's it's very subconscious and i guess like once ideally like maybe once a month i would sit down and kind of evaluate everything but the truth is i probably evaluate maybe every three months or so every I don't know when I feel like it. <laughs> so it's, it, it roughly mm-hmm. feels like every couple of months or so. It, it, it depends on where I'm at, but like, um, you know, so there are things that I just do all the time. So I'm always talking to people. I'm always, you know, even now I'm reaching a stage where I kind of wonder if there are people on Twitter who feel uncomfortable that I'm in their replies because they have 300 followers and I have 30,000. Like, you know, to me, it's just, I'm just some guy on the internet talking to other people on the internet. But I wonder if I'm reaching a threshold where it makes people uncomfortable and I have to be sensitive to that. Uh, but yeah, you know, that's just kind of an example of like, again, like the grand vision is whatever super library, but like it requires a lot of people. And like, you know, it requires people who understand each other and people who have a shared understanding. And so one way to do that is to talk to lots and lots of people that doesn't scale, right? Like, so I can talk to a lot of, I can talk to dozens of people a day, but if I want to be talking to thousands of people, like then I should have content. I should have videos, blog posts, books. And, um, you know, the, everything that I'm putting in my books is stuff that I already have in, um, in tweets and threads and blog posts. And, uh, 
so the way I think about my books is actually very simple. I think about my books as condensed conversations that I've had with people. So it's like I I period I regularly get people in my DMs asking me questions, and I to answer their questions I typically so initially I'm just answering off off the cuff right I'm just saying whatever comes to mind. Once I've talked to like ten people twenty people I'm like oh the twenty people that I've spoken to every single one of them has or like you know eighty percent of them all have the same question about how do I not feel like a failure in life right That's a pretty common question people ask and so I'm like okay I should make some content about how do I not feel like a failure in life. So I have a YouTube video about that. And now I can share that video with anybody who has that question. And then I continue having more conversations with people. And so, you know, it just, it just it compounds. Like you keep talking to people, you, sh- you see where they get stuck. You, you have, then you, you talk through a bunch of people about where they get stuck. And then um, you, you formulate some kind of solution, sort of. And then um, you share that with more people. And then that usually goes viral a little bit I mean, relative to what you normally post because... It resonates with people because it hits a pain point that somebody has. If if it's a pro- if it's a if it's a problem someone has described, it's a problem that multiple people have because someone has described it. And so then when you solve it, multiple people will have a solution. To, multiple people will enjoy that solution. And uh, when you then hear from more of those people, and then they all be like, "Oh, but what about this? What about that? You know, how about the details of that?" And then that's where the book, that's how the book kind of comes together. It's just answering all the questions that people have. All right. So. Um, in fact, I think the earliest formats of all of my books, well, both of my books, so I have two books, uh, both both books started out as FAQs, basically, right? It's just documentation for what, what people ask me and what I think the solutions are and what the follow-up questions are. But, uh, you know, I've oscillated on this. An FAQ is a great way to present information in like a blog or something, like a reference document for people to follow. But it's not a great way to write a book. And I, I'm not entirely sure why this is. I'm still trying to piece it together and figuring it out. But there's something about the principles of storytelling that I'm trying to understand. And, you know, I've always, again, I just love books and I love libraries. So I would like to participate in that process. But I mean, I guess if you're asking a question of like, why should a book exist? You know, why, 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 why a book? You know, and it's like, a book is a series, of, it's a reading experience from start to finish. Right? I'm not going to say it's a series of blog posts because that's actually a bit different. But, um, you know, a book is a reading experience from start to finish that basically you should write a book the moment a single blog post or a couple of blog posts can't cut it. Right? Like, so you write a couple of blog posts and it solves somebody's problem, but like you just need to bring them on a bigger, longer walk. It's like a, it's a journey, right? It's like, and I, I, I kind of use the same principle for talking about a lot of other things. You know, it's like, uh, so I had I, I started out making long videos on YouTube because I just wanted to ramble for as long as possible and, and practice <laughs> speaking. But that, that, that was not meant to be uh, packaged for users, for readers, for viewers, right? Like I, I make it because I can and because, you know, it's public because if people want to see it, they can see it. But I don't really like, recommend strongly that people go and watch it because you know it's like 40 minutes like if you want to if you want to sit through that you can and people do do that and they do get value out of it but the end goal is just i'm still developing myself i'm still again it's a long game so i'm still getting into the habit of speaking and getting familiar with my talking points and then now my videos are shorter now my videos are like 10 minutes sometimes 20 minutes but mostly 10 minutes eight minutes nine minutes and as i repeat myself over and over again i will get more confident i will get more experienced i will receive feedback from other people i'll integrate that and then eventually it's going to get down to like three minutes four minutes of really intense content and then there will come a point where a series of the kind of um, heaviest shots, right? Like you think of a three minute video as like a shot. It's just kind of um, not, well, it, it will help people to some degree, but just a series of shots does not, that if, if you try to have a series of good shots, it can imply a certain bigger vision or worldview or something, but, it doesn't, and that will be very helpful to a, but to a subset of people, but it doesn't take people all the way there. So, you know, the, and that's, that's like what a book is supposed to be, you know, in my, in my frame, you know, so a book is, it's like a city. It's like a walk through a whole city in a, in a sense. And, and, uh, you know, you can never show anyone an entire city in a single walk. 
because it's just you need to be there constantly for years and watch how things you know and watch this place come up this place shut down and and experience it different hours of the day take different you know to understand a city is a it's a lifelong project but um you know uh a book is is you you get you get i almost want to say that the point of the book is a commitment of from the part of the reader you know the point of the book is that the reader makes a commitment to sitting with these ideas for this length of time and this length of to go on such a long walk right so it's like it's like suppose you want to go for a walk every day for like half an hour right like just yeah, to, to stay healthy or whatever you go for a walk every day you get fitter and whatever but then um the, why would you want to go for like a pilgrimage of like a long walk of like you know like a marathon length walk over the course of a whole day or go walking hiking on a trail for for weeks right the idea of doing these larger things is not just to get your steps in right but to undergo a journey where you expect to learn things about yourself along the way and be transformed along the way like uh, a book should do that you know so I, I have very high standards for what a book should do which is why i'm taking so long with my second book and uh but yeah i i do you know i believe that i have been transformed by books myself in growing up and there is a certain relationship between a person and the book they're reading if the book is good if the book has soul right if the book really represents an author's intent and they are they are they're really trying to show you a lot one all, all at once one after another sequentially in order they're trying to really get you to consider and inhabit a space for days on end that's just a very powerful thing it's it's a form of intimacy and you do you see how it is it's like getting someone to read your tweets yeah read a blog post cool but to read a book is a big ask and it's you you're in you're asking them to invite your thoughts to inhabit their mind for a pretty long period of time it's a very very intimate thing to ask and you know part of me is I, i i desire intimacy in that sense uh but also it's just you know i believe that just i've learned a lot of things i can help a lot of people i have helped a lot of people and but it's in a very piecemeal way and it would just be great if i can just recommend a book to someone like if someone needs help i can just give them my book you know that's a beautiful it's a beautiful thing beautiful option to have like a uh, here is the book that here so together friendly ambitious nut and introspect they will together be you know the sum of what has helped me through my teens and 20s through my loneliness and and uncertainty and kinship like recreating myself again there's no substitute for like having someone like dinesh sit next to you for five and a half years and you talk to them every day but like it's the next best thing i think that i can give a lot of people so that's what i want to do hmm. how do the other books that you plan to write fit in i know that you there's like six or seven different books that you have planned in the future what are what yeah, are I'm just not, roughly I'm, what are those about mm-hmm. so i'm not entirely sure if i'm gonna necessarily 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 write all of them um so there's you know the the, the natural follow-up to introspect is optics and optics is like it's almost like the external version of introspect it's about like so if introspect is about figuring out your own internal narratives Optics is kind of about understanding how society works and how like you know visuals and so not not just literally visuals but like uh you know just how people see things how people perceive them each other I mean so themselves is already kind of introspect ish but like there's just how things relate to each other visually perceptually that kind of thing um I'm not super excited about it right now though because I'm getting like fatigued from writing introspect it's just really You know, I I don't know what I was thinking, but it's one of those books where I feel like I can be updating it for decades, right? Like if you really dig into it, you go into Jungian psychology and and IFS and and behavioral therapy and it's just it's uh trying to talk about what it's like inside your someone's head. It's a lifelong thing. Like so like I'm I'm trying to I started this book like 3 or 2 and a half years ago and I'm like I have to ship something, but like it's never going to be you know good i mean i'm going to say good it's it's not, what i have in mind is like 
I want it to be, you know, a successor to Young's Red Book, let's say, right? And he wrote that. In, he, first of all, he's an amazing psychologist, like one of the top tier, best in the world kind of psychologists, ex- experts of subconsciousness. And he and he took like 20 years to write that, 15 to 20 years to write that after 20 years of experience. So it's like, I just, first of all, I'm probably not going to be able to do it. Second of all, if I were able to do a fraction of that, it would not be at 31 years old. I would be doing it like in my 50s or 60s or something. Like just just as a matter of experience, right? Sheer volume. Um, so, but I, I do feel like I want to publish version one now anyway, just to see what happens. And and it's like, it has to be part of a conversation. Like I can't, I can't put it in a vault and then it gets better while it's in the vault. It has to get better by, pe- it's like the how to save Singapore thing again, right? It's like people will attack me for it for the, the le- have legitimate criticisms of me for it because I will be wrong about a bunch of stuff that I don't even realize I'm wrong about. But that's the only way I can learn, right? So I have to share it and people will have to tell me I'm an idiot and be like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and then I'll have to update it and correct it. Um, optics. Uh, I had another idea. I have I have multiple ideas. So there's optics, there's high voltage living. High voltage living, I think, it, you, you know, so the way I think about these things is like coming up with the idea of a book is does not necessarily mean that the book should be published. It's just it's just like a thinking um, experiment. So I know that I will probably want to write um, constructive ADHD, which is like a just I've been doing a bunch of I, I never I never set out to write about ADHD. I didn't even think I had it until so Dinesh was one who suggested that I might have it. So like for the first twenty two years of my life, nobody it never occurred to anybody that I might have ADHD. And Dinesh was the first to suggest it and I looked it up and I was initially in denial about it. And it's funny because the blog post that I wrote denying that I have ADHD, if you read that blog post, I very obviously have ADHD. Like halfway through, I'm like asking what is the purpose of money? What is the purpose of a job? In a blog post about about like, do I have ADHD? And like, not I wasn't doing it as like a guy with ADHD cleverly pretend, like, like revealing his ADHD like as a joke. Like I genuinely thought I didn't have it. I genuinely thought I didn't have it and I genuinely went on these huge ten- meandering tangents and I was like, oh, where was I? Anyway, yeah, I don't have ADHD. Like, it was genuine. It's funny. You can look it up. You can look it up. It's really it's really something. And, you know, that that itself, I think, is a beautiful thing to behold in retrospect. Like, you look at it again, you're like, huh, I was so convinced that I didn't have a condition and it is so obvious to me now that I had it in that moment where I thought I didn't have it. And there is a, a genuine humility that you get from that when you see the disparity between your sense of certainty about yourself and what is, a fairly short while later, what is obvious to the observer's eye, right? Like, uh, I also remember when I was a teenager, like 16, 17, I did not, I thought of myself as a fun, happy-go-lucky, cheerful guy. Which, was, which had a truth to it, but I was also chronically anxious all the time and I was in denial about that. And like I, it's very interesting to, if you have a journal especially, or you know, if, you have, if you have videos, I think that's even better. Like if you're vlogging regularly and you can see when you are saying I'm a fun guy and you can see the anxiety and uncertainty, like the, the muscular tension in the face and then the nervousness and all that, like that would be... Anyway, I digress. Um, you know, I have these ideas... I, I mean, I would I would say think of my book plans as like a expedition ideas in a sense. So I know that I want to do something big about optics. I know that I want to do something big about um, just storytelling in general, about framing, which is very directly related to storytelling. But, you know, it's like they could be... It could be one of those books where you flip the book upside down and it's, an, it's an, you know, it's back. I don't know. I got I to gotta figure it out. I, it, this... These things, they they kind of have their own internal logic to them. Once you put them out there, you, you put these ideas in, in public and people will respond to them a certain way. You yourself will respond to them a certain way as you revisit it over and over again. You know, when I started Introspect, I initially thought it was going to be a book about um, defining your utility values, like figuring out what, articulating what you want. Like that was kind of, where I started with like how do you know what you want and um it deviated from that quite a bit you know and I it's it's not that I the book is no longer about finding out what you want but that the frame of finding out what you want is something that 
I'm convinced must fit within a bigger picture of who are you, right? What's your identity? What's your what's your self concept? How do you contemplate your narrative? Like like all of these questions are, are the the kind of um, and again, I'm not I'm not completely sure about this either. It's just how I'm currently thinking about it, and so my thinking evolves while I'm writing the book, which then makes me kind of rewrite the book from scratch i've now re- rewritten the book about six times and i can already see how if i wanted to rewrite it from scratch again i would do it again in a different way but i'm not going to do that because they'll just kill me but um yeah so there, there is this compromise between you know what you would like to do and what you should what you can do right now right like uh if i if i postpone it indefinitely it'll kill me i think it'll just it'll just i, I don't want to be that guy who is working on a book and has been working on a book for for years and years and years. Even though that is what people in the past did, so you know there is there is this tension here. Like, and but the thing is, you can you can ship a book. You can ship. That's the beautiful thing about ebooks. You can ship the ebook and say it's version one, and then you can be like, aha! But version two is like a whole different animal. And then people will be like, oh wow! You can see how he re- you can really see how he evolved from. And that's the case with some of my old threads and my newer threads, where you can see. And even there are some threads where. You know, there's a thread from 2015 where I'm like upset and and depressed, and then I update it in like 2019 or 2020, and like it really adds like nobody else. Who else does that? Like it's it's a it's a it's a entire kind of um, I want to say art form in of itself. Like the the multi year thread where you respond to old tweets from years ago, and there's that whiplash from the change in perspective. Like that's that's something that. Um, I want to be doing all my life. You know, I want to be, I want to be quote tweeting myself 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the line. Like I, I find that exciting. It's like spirit, like it's, there's a, there's a beautiful sense of my relationship with myself evolving. Um, there's more stuff I want to write. Like I can talk for hours about all the things I want to write. You know, I want to write about, I have this essay I want to do about smartphones and how they have, how technology has, has changed our relationship with each other, with ourselves, with reality itself. Um, I have research projects I want to do about Southeast Asian history. You know, I want to do I want to do a thing about like how did Buddhism spread from India to China and Southeast Asia exactly? Like, I, I want to know. Like, it's just you know, I've, 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 I've there's there's all these questions that I have that I want to explore, and the ch- the danger is that um or you know the thing that is because we have limited time on this earth, right? As like in this specific lifetime at least, um when we want to do projects, we have to scope them appropriately. And uh, and because we have resource constraints and we have financial constraints and all those things, audience constraints, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there is a danger of spending too long on any one project that does... Th- there's an opportunity cost to that, you know? And um, again, like from a certain rational point of view, the amount of time I've spent on introspect is not ideal. But that is one limited perspective that does not uh i can argue both sides on this you know i can argue and say that i should have paused introspect a year ago or six months ago and i should have written and shipped constructive adhd instead because there's a much clearer addressable market for that Uh, i will make a lot more money from that i will grow my audience a lot faster from that like just what visa knows about adhd and like the number of people who are who are eager to solve their adhd problem like it's just it's it's uh I should, you know, like financially, it makes sense. Audience building wise, it makes sense. But like, I almost, you know, I feel like introspect is almost like my Moby Dick, kind of my white whale. Like I want to, and again, I'm going to ship it. So, you know, if, if I don't ship it this month, like come in and, and ask me what the fuck's going on. Okay, but like, um, you know, um, I do feel like I have to cross some personal thresholds to publish introspect because it means so much to me that, Everything I do after introspect, I feel will have a different glow to it, if that makes sense. It's like, uh, you know, one of my personal narratives for myself is that um, it's like I have an engine. And for some reason, for some reason in my mind, this engine has 10 cylinders. I don't know why. It just, it has 10. It, it, it could be an arbitrary number. It could be, I don't know why. But like, um, you know, and I started out firing on one. And then, which is like, and then two, three, four. I am now on, I'm either on five or six, 
no, no, I'm not, I'm not at six yet. I'm at like, um, I'm at about five. You know, so, so, so the way I put it was, I think one is being smart, two is being smart and kind, three was being smart, kind, and uh, oh, I got to look this up. I'm not sure. Let me look it up. Three from second so read cylinders. It's happening. I'm in the middle of a call and I'm searching my own tweets. We went, we, we made it a good, a good what, hour, hour, 10 minutes yeah. that I could go without searching my own tweets. Uh, engine, cylinders. It's part of my brain. Oh man, cylinders. Uh, yeah, so in 2018, I tweeted, if I were forced to make an estimate, I think I'm 20% of the way through my creative final form. I'm firing on about two out of 10 cylinders and I'm about to unlock the third. And the first is the hardest. This was in 2018. And I said, yeah, I said my trip to SF and a year of living as a feral free agent unlocked my third cylinder. So the first cylinder was smart. The second cylinder was kind. Third cylinder was playful. And I think the fourth cylinder might be something like fearless or free. Um, and so when I, when I shipped Friendly Ambitious Nerd and I conceived of uh, my Domino's meme, I decided that the fourth cylinder was firing. And... Uh, and I said in 2020, at stage five, in about one to two years, I think, I'll be financially independent. And then at stage six, I'll be deploying assets for others. And stage 10 is a golden age, air horns I'm making fun of. But like, um, yeah, you know, so stage five. So, so what's crazy, I'm looking at this 2020 tweet and I'm saying in stage five, in about one or two years, I'll be financially independent. And then stage six, I'll be deploying assets for others. But that's true. Like, it's, it's like I, in 2020, I was describing my future. And it's real, you know, it's like, it's kind of wild. Like you can really kind of, mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, you know, I'm always, I'm always, I'm always mindful of the fact that I might be fucking crazy. You know, you know? like I, I, I am not, um, you know, I think there are some people who are really um, far out visionaries to the point where they do not inhibit, inhabit ordinary reality. Like, uh, I think Prince was like that, the, the musical artist. I think Prince was Prince 24-7. Mm -hmm. And, like, he just, he related to reality differently than everyone else. Uh, I think Kanye spends a lot of time in that space. Kanye West, he spends a lot of time in that space where he's really manic kind of, you know, modern, contemporary society does not know how to manage people who, who have this kind of ups and downs. But um, I have tasted that sometimes, but I do spend most of my time in the ordinary world. And so it's like I have this communion with this 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 kind of manic king energy where he's like, I know what's going to happen. You know, I'm going to marry this girl. I'm going to make a living on the internet. I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want. I'm going to make friends with, you know, like, like, like all these things that I say. And then I, I, I maybe I write it down and then I look at it the next day and I'm like, dude, I'm so tired, man. I'm like, like what, what the fuck is this? I'm going to make friends with the most build the greatest social graph in human history. What the fuck are you talking about? Like, you know, it's like, just like, like there is this multi-part thing to it, but he's right though. That's the, that's the, like, I almost wish I was wrong sometimes because it would be easier to live my life if my visionary statements turned out to be bullshit. And then I can just be like, Oh, I'm an idiot. And I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. I should just live my life. But I'm like, my visionary claims that I don't feel like I can take entire credit for. You know, I don't feel like it's the guy that's talking to you right now. It's not the guy who makes the proclamation. I don't know where those proclamations come from. You could say that it comes from some higher source. I don't know. I don't know. But like those claims when they are made are to me frustratingly, astonishingly on point. You know, and it's like, ah, oh, there's a lot of responsibility in that. You know, Steve Jobs has a quote about, you know, when he was not didn't have a lot of money like it's fun to dream like oh it would be nice to you know have a company or it would be nice to do some charity like it would be nice if i had a billion dollars and he's like when you do have the billion dollars right and you do have the means to make your vision a reality there's a lot more responsibility in in that because now you are held accountable at least by yourself if you have a, if you're a person with with uh, any kind of intellectual honesty any kind of of you know sincerity uh, when you have the means to make your vision a reality, there is a lot of responsibility in that because now if it doesn't happen, it's your fault. <laughs> you know? Whereas previously, if it didn't happen, it's like, well, the world didn't give me authority. The world didn't give me money and power. So, eh, what can you do? 
But like when you get it, you know, and so Marianne Williamson has a quote that's like, uh, our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our greatest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. And I used to be like, that feels like a cool mm-hmm. quote, but I don't get it. <laughs> and then I, I think I got it when I was um, just reflecting on my own personal growth and then thinking about like, so in take the Spider-Man quote, which is with great power comes great responsibility. And, and you connect those two quotes together. So, you know, Mary, Mary, when you combine Marianne Williamson and, and Peter Parker or Uncle Ben, right, whatever, it becomes a, our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our greatest fear is that we have responsibility beyond measure, right? If you think, it's just kind of, you know, Marianne's quote was, mm-hmm. we are powerful beyond measure, right? We are more, more powerful than we can imagine. Great. Like, you know, like, let me, I mean, when, when you hear someone, do you want unlimited power? They're like, yes, power. But like power is responsibility. Like it is like once you have the means affect reality, you, you know, whether or not there are people in your life who are going to hold you accountable, if you have a conscience, your conscience will hold you accountable. Like, what are you doing with your power? Right. And just immense power is immense responsibility. So it's like, and responsibility is scary, right? It's like if things go well, if things go badly, it's your fault. Like, and that that, that might be some childhood shit about that you have to deal with. But like, it's just um, grappling with that has been uh, challenging. So I I put off taking responsibility for you know. So like, I think in twenty eighteen, I tweeted things like, um, I would love to follow someone else. And so that's after I left the nation. After maybe I don't know. But like, you know, so even Dinesh, like I admire him tremendously as for doing what he's doing. But we have different visions, I think. Like they're complementary visions. Like we both want a lot of the same things, but we have different things that we want to focus on. And we work better as like, you know, we will probably find other ways to help each other out in the future. But um, just Dinesh doing his thing is not perfectly aligned with the thing that I want to see done. But there's no one doing the thing that I want to see done. So for at least two years, I chose not to do anything because, or I chose to like study and 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 if and evaluate and hold back and perceive the world and watch what's going on and see, look for is anyone else trying to do it? You know, like 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 it's just I am a flawed human being, right? I have you know appetites and and anger and just there should be some other kingly person to go forth and be noble and gracious and, and just beautiful. And, you know, and I can help him, right. I can be behind his shoulder, giving him guidance and advice and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, ah, there isn't anyone like that for me though. So it's like, I have to do it, you know? And and I, I was in denial of that for a very long time because I think again, subconsciously, you know that being the person to take on the mantle of responsibility means you're going to get, attacked when you when things go bad right like it's just you're gonna get haters you're gonna it's just it's not fun you know it's it's responsibility and so you know i put the crown in my twitter avatar and my youtube avatar it's not i'm so great i'm a fucking king yeah you know it's not it's not like that it's really it's a reminder to myself of the responsibility that i have to behave in a just and fair and and you know kind of courageous way like it's just that that embodiment of you know someone that people so to be that person that i wish existed right i wish there existed a good king that would you know take initiative make good things happen you know help solve problems adjudicate right just just all all the things you can imagine think of a generous you know benevolent noble king that people can come to for help right like uh even if you see like um the opening scenes of the godfather like with uh what's his actor's name remember his name but it's like there's that sense right the reason people love that movie is that there's this sense of here's an honorable man okay he's doing organized crime which is fucked up but like here's a man with this with a code with a sense of honor who is trying to do the right thing within his th- it's like people are drawn to that we we admire and respect that like it's a you know or the way we romanticize samurais or knights or whatever like we know that it's usually like pr and it's kind of you know the reality of it was messier but yeah you know i just feel like um there is where where am i going with it where, where do we start i was just talking about uh my books right <laughs> and yeah i just feel like um these books, they 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 are 
Well, you know, one, one, one really simplistic... So I was giving you like kind of these elaborate, complicated ways of talking about it. Just like, oh, a book is an experience and an invitation to the reader and blah, blah, blah. Like, okay, like if we flip the whole thing around, if you look at famous public intellectuals throughout history, practically like all of them have books. Like you just, you know, it's just like it's, it's, a, it's a necessary step if you want to be a great public intellectual you have to write a book. Like it's just, it's it's a way for people to interface with your ideas and to consider you seriously. You can build, like you can't, you again, like a, a problem for some Twitter intellectuals or whatever is that they get overly fixated on a lot of activity on Twitter and it feels noisy and it feels like there's a lot going on, but it's still within Twitter. It's still this bubble. And if you want to reach out beyond that bubble, you have to have media that can travel. So YouTube is a huge part of that. And um, a book is a big part of that as well. And, you know, it could be that, <laughs> you know, Jane Jacobs wrote The Death and Life of Americans, Great American Cities in when she was 45 years old. That was the first book she published. I'm sure it's not the first thing she wrote. Or, you know, if she had been writing, if if, if she had, she must have been writing for decades or, or whatever. It's a great book. and she, And there's no way... You know, she just woke up one day at 44 and wrote it in a year. Like, it's just having worked on a book for a year, I know what work goes into writing a book. And it could be that everything I'm doing with my tweets and my books and all of that stuff, it's all just preparation for, for what? I don't know. Like, it might be that when I'm 50 years old, there is an opportunity brought forward by geopolitics that we cannot anticipate, right? Like maybe nation states will be changing. Maybe climate change shit will be happening. And like, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know that somebody with a large audience with um, that has earned the goodwill and trust of a lot of people that is a good writer who can write a book. And if you write a good book then that addresses the concerns of people then, uh, that's the thing I would like to do if the opportunity presents itself. So I'm, I'm, I'm always preparing, right, for, for some future thing while also trying to have fun in the moment, right? And uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know if, I don't know if that, that uh, it's a very meandering path, but uh, that's this way. Yeah, I'm no, at. that answers my question. Um, I think um, there's at least two questions I want to make sure that I get time to ask you. Um, the first one is kind of related to what you were talking about of responsibility in the sort of station that you found yourself in uh, is um, something that I've reflected a lot on over the years with my Twitter presence in particular is the ethics of speech and mm -hmm. what to say and how to say it and when and why. And I'm really continually iterating on that. And I'd be curious to hear how you hold that the ethics of what you say uh through your twitter presence and other and other platforms that you have like the ethics of speech how you hold that right um <sighs> ethics i so when i was younger i used to think that you should just speak as honestly and forcefully and passionately as you can and whatever happens happens so be it you know that i felt like that was uh that was my and i think that's a good position for youth to have you know when you're a teenager like just if you're angry be angry you know if you're passionate be passionate like just get it all out like don't don't be an old man as a child you know when you're a child be a child be 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 forceful be be passionate and uh i think and this is something that I learned from Dinesh as well, is just when you become an adult, um, you start to have experience, you start to have knowledge, you start to see how things play out and you start to understand that if I say A, B or C, the outcomes will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then if I skip A and B and I start with D and then I go to C, like it's, it's consistently a much more favorable outcome. So... You know, like the ethics is almost downstream of, of knowledge. You have to know what's going to happen. You have to have some idea of how things happen. And um, when you have enough practice and you've done enough study, um, you start to know that with some degree of, not perfect confidence, but some degree of confidence that people will respond to certain utterances a certain way, right? And... Um, I try my I tr 
I try to invite and encourage a constructive, nourishing space, right? So I try to, with my speech, try to invite people to to be. I don't want to say positive. I don't know how, how to uh, ethics of speech. Uh Uh, I, th- hmm, I think so. Speech. A simple, a simple way to get at it would be: Do you have any rules for yourself about what you would or would not say, or how you say things? Well, not it's not super explicit, but like, uh, you know, so I, I am pretty flexible, and I enjoy the intellectual challenge of, you know, um, if there's something that I think I should not say because it will ruffle some feathers or make people upset or whatever, I then set about thinking, well, how can I say it? How can I say it in a way that people will receive, um, you know, without interpreting it as an attack? And it's not that I'm afraid to attack people. Like I did, I had my, I did my fair share of attacking people when I was a political blogger. Right? I used to attack people in power, and I mean, even even when, but you know, it's like when you read that, it's like I was, you know, I was attacking politicians for being out of touch. Like it's not like I was, and I wasn't, I wasn't vindictive. Like I would say, if if you read it, it'll still see it's recognizably Visa. You know, it's not like holy shit, I can't believe Visa ever said things like that. It's, like, it's still me. I was just kind of more, you know, like like these politicians are so out of touch, that kind of thing, and um. Yeah, you know, the thing that annoys me is speech that does not have does not help achieve the outcomes that I want. So that's that's in a way it's a kind of consequentialist, I guess, ethics. But I don't I don't think about I don't think about it in those terms. I think about what do I want to see? What is the outcome that I want? And what is it I have to say to achieve those outcomes? Right. So like um. If there is a thing that I want to say that probably won't achieve the outcomes that I want, then I most probably will post it on my locked alt, maybe, or another one of my alts. And uh, and very often, sometimes, you know, I, I I kind of test out some utterances on my alts, and then people talk to me in response, and then I kind of workshop the utterances there before I post it on me. But um, yeah, the thing is, I, I want to avoid... Um, summoning demons right so i have i have this concept of demon summoning which is a demon and in, 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 i'm i use the word demon kind of metaphorically which is like mm-hmm. um a demon is a is a spirit that is amongst people so you know like bloodlust is a demon um vengeance is a demon outrage is a demon just just there is this this energy this force that that once you allow it to take hold once you, you encourage it and it, it it's like a fire right once it crosses a certain threshold it no longer listens to you it becomes it becomes a thing of itself it has its own agenda its desire to consume everything and so you cannot unsummon a demon once you've summoned it and you know you so i will never use i will never quote tweet someone to attack them right like i, I might i might sometimes quote tweet people to to kind of post my opinions but you'll notice that i'm pretty careful to be like i see what this person is saying but i think this is this you know i i would never be like look at this piece of shit you know <laughs> like, because that invites what i don't want to see it invites smearing and dunking and attacking and 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 it's a uh, you know i might do a little bit of that in dms with extremely trusted friends that i i trust them to have a sense of proportion and not go too far like uh but um, I would never do that on main because, again, there are always people who, again, no fault of their own, right? But it's just if they themselves are unbalanced and unintegrated and they have demon sympathies, right? There's some part of them that is eager to look for a target to attack. And they might think, oh, you know, I follow Visa. He seems great. He seems to have a good moral compass. So if he's attacking someone, that person probably deserves to be attacked because he never attacks anyone. And then they, they relinquish their personal judgment and they go along with it. And that is extremely bad. Like that, that start, you know, it's funny. I was joking with my wife yesterday earlier. was like, um, she said, are you saying that one, um, one bad event leads to disaster? I'm like, no, one bad event leads to two bad events, right? Like, and, mm-hmm. and then it spirals. 
And yeah, so you know, I just think that, and, and this is what the crown is for. The crown is to remind me that my utterances have consequences, right? And a lot of people on our part of Twitter, especially, you know, and again, it's like they, have, they don't have many followers. They, they think of Twitter as something that they're doing for fun. It's not serious. They don't think that their utterances have consequences or they don't think very much about it. Whereas for me, it's like every utterance I make is part of this great tapestry that I'm building and inviting people to join. And it's like, I cannot afford the, the cost of, of uh, just unthoughtful utterances. So every utterance I make has to, and you know, it's like I, I tweet off the cuff a lot, but like it's, if it's in the sphere of things that I understand and I'm familiar with, like I can do it pretty casually, but like um, just no dunking, no, no, no personal attacks, no, um, no kind of bad faith readings, no implications of, of like that sort of thing. Like, you know, some people say things like don't talk about politics. I'm like, the reason I don't really talk very much about politics, is not that I'm avoiding it. It's that I'm playing a very, very long game and I'm not very interested in day to day policy stuff that often like okay once in a while there's there might be some so like in singapore a couple of years ago there was a there was like an internet censorship policy that i was very much against and so i, I spoke up against it and i gave like a speech at a, at a thing and it, it didn't make any difference but like you know i'm mm-hmm. proud of myself for kind of stepping up to speak up against a policy that i thought was unjust and i've made my position on that clear but it got passed anyway so <laughs> but in the grand scheme of things um, you know, I, I so so this is something that it's kind of related to what you were asking at the very start of the whole conversation, which is that in, and the way I think about things is almost a bit radical in that I think of I think in a very uh, I don't know if you would call it abstract. I almost don't believe in institutions. Like I almost don't believe they exist. Sort of like I, I kind of I kind of care. Like and how, how what I mean by that is like. You know, so my wife is pretty passionate about law and understanding the law and reading the law and like, you know, what what sentences get passed for this, who are the which lawmakers pass which law, what like that's all the court stuff. How does the court work? Like, you know, what's the uh, what, who are the judges, the appointees, and all that. And like, I understand the the utility of having people in your life who know those things well. But the way I see it is, the law is just people. Like that's that's how I think about it. It's really any organization is just people. It's just people trying to figure out how what to do about things, right? And laws change when, again, they'd be like, oh, you got to pass a, a, a bill and the bill has to pass the... I'm like, laws change when enough people want it to change. That's how I think about it. You know, it's like... It's, and, and like to get enough... How do you get enough people to want to change a law? Oh, you have to get enough people to know about it and you have to get enough... Like that kind of... That's how I think about it. It's really very... Um, it's almost child. It's like it's like child childishly simple in concept, but adultly um, intense in persistent implementation. Right. So it's like, yeah, it's like, uh, well, what are the first, first principles thinking? I guess right, sort of, and um, yeah. So with regards to utterances, I just want to build a lot of relationships with a lot of good people and seek people that I respect and admire and pretty much everyone I respect and admire um, would understand the value of being kind of um, gracious in your uh, in your speech right so it's like it's like you speak like a king basically right like uh, like mm-hmm. don't 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 send out whiny <laughs> bitch complaint tweets right like it's, it's just it's not befitting. I mean, like, like, I might joke around. I think it's it's fine to joke. Like, having a sense of humor is great. It shows that you don't take yourself too seriously, right? Like, don't... Like, if you can have fun posting nonsense in a non-consequential way and people can see that you're human and, you know, like, all of those things, yeah. But, like... What was I'm, thinking of, I'm, I'm thinking of the tweet where you uh, posted about uh, titties. You were just like, titties. <laughs> or at least you're, I, I thought yes. that was great. You know, I was like, yes. you're just yeah. you're just saying it, man. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. it has to be said. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, uh, there's there's a duality to it. Do you see? Like, So, like, I can imagine an insufferable person 
who would never post titty because he uh-huh. takes himself too seriously. Right? He yeah. he feels that what he tweets is is uh, is should is solemn, grave importance. Like ah, that's stuffy, man. Like, I don't wanna I don't wanna be a stuffy guy. You know, I don't wanna be someone that you know children are scared of or people avoid or have to manage. Like like I'm a guy. You know, I'm not I'm not not human. But when I am talking about anything substantial. Uh, then so it's, it's all about context right it's yes. like it's being sensitive to different contexts like and you know it's always funny to me when people suddenly sound like they don't understand context because people know that it's you probably shouldn't wear like a bright pink mini skirt to a funeral unless the the person was your unless you know that the person wanted it right like there's 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 like so that, that so the general context is you should probably wear muted um dull colors to a funeral but there's an exception to that context where if the deceased wanted y'all to have a party at his funeral then yes let's have a funeral party and it's colorful and whatever and that's what they wanted like we understand that very well we understand that um adults don't swear at children and children don't swear at adults like there's a demarcation there we understand it like we don't like again you like we don't necessarily go into you can geek out about it and it's something about status right like um you don't swear at your, uh, like like service staff don't swear at customers, um, and like managers don't swear at service staff in certain contexts. But they might swear at like at a party, or they might you know it's like there's there's this whole beautifully complex rich tapestry about when swearing is and is not appropriate, you know. And and we understand this like you don't really need to explain to people for the most part. Like most people understand the appropriateness of swearing, right? And um, there is a similar thing about just when to be how how just how to how to make a trans so you you start with the premise of I am a powerful person with with, with whose utterances are consequential. You start with that and then be like, okay, I can have fun though. You know, there's, there's no reason I can't have fun. But I'm never gonna pretend that what I say doesn't have consequences. Because that's that's the road to hell, basically. When I start to pretend like, oh, I can insult this person, it's not a big deal. You know, it's it's I'm just having a bad day or whatever. Like I, I hold myself to higher standards on that front. Um yeah. <laughs> that's a great answer. Thank you. Um yeah, I want to come back to um uh, just as a to close out the conversation. Um it's a little bit vulnerable to me ask, but I think it, I think it bears mentioning given your, the work and what you're trying to do. It's, um, you know, you, you sort of casually said in the beginning of the conversation, like, oh yeah, we're friends. And you, you referred to me as a friend and like mm-hmm. parts of me are like, yeah, definitely we're friends. And parts of me are like, Hmm, what do you, what do you mean by friend and how do you hold that? Mm-hmm. And what exactly is a friend to you? And mm-hmm. um, cause I, I think there's a spectrum there of what a friend is and, what that means and i'm just curious how you hold that and what that word means to you and uh, both in general and you know i guess practically and specific in our connection but just in general what what friendship means to you right so um my my kind of um shortest answer for what a friend is is a person that you have a shared understanding with and like um the the deeper the friendship the the more and again if you think about what a shared understanding is like if you think of each person having if you imagine a, so this is going to get nerdy but like if you imagine a, a, a graph of your understanding of everything right of the world of yourself of your feelings of blah 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 and then you imagine my understanding right and that we any two people by being human right will have overlaps in their in their shared in their understandings but they may not be aware of what those overlaps are and like the great tragedy of life is that people are much more aware of the parts of their graphs, their, their personal brain graphs, mind graphs, emotion graphs, whatever. Like where the conflicts are, people become very aware of. And then they fight about that. They go to war about that. They kill each other. So it's very tragic. And But we tend to lose t- sight of our common humanity. So in a sense, you know, like there's this concept of um, universal basic friend. Like there's this person who, I don't know if that's the exact phrase they use, but... Uh, so like we have we have a Twitter friend called Default Friend, and I think she was referencing um, 
there was this person in the US, might have been California, who's, who was known as like universal friend or something. And like mm-hmm, she, mm-hmm. that lady was like, just I am a friend to everyone. And and like, I, I see how that can be, you know, is that it's in, in her... F- and, and then we might say like, but of course she didn't, she wasn't literally friends with everybody because not she couldn't have known everybody and there are a lot of people who don't know her. But like what her point was, was that she was dedicating her life to be... To inhabit that, to volunteer to inhabit that role, right? So that, that's just one way of putting it, right? So the word is, the word does a lot of work in a lot of different contexts. But when I describe someone as my friend, I, you know, so I, I don't say my friend about like every other person. I mean, ah, that's, there, there might be some colloquial contexts where I'm meeting someone for the first time and I'm like, hey, friend, you know, like, it's 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 a, it's a bit of a bid, you know. Like I'm trying it on to see how they, but but you know when I describe when I talk about you, when I talk about most of my Twitter mutuals, um, especially if we've met and we've had conversations, especially if we've yeah if we've met and we've had a conversation, um, we very likely have a shared understanding of something that is deep enough that, um. I can trust that the person would not necessarily behave in specific predictable ways, but that they would they would understand me, right? So that's that's the thing. So I trust that having had our having had the conversations that we've had, I would trust. So there are a few things I would trust you to do. I would trust you to be able to to reasonably kind of simulate me or represent me to somebody else, like in conversation at a party or whatever, and be like, uh, you know, someone says somebody give a toast that Visa would give. I would trust that you would be able to do that better than like someone who follows me on Twitter but doesn't know me very well. That you know like a like a like a Twitter follower, right? Like like maybe there might be some Twitter follower that I don't know who would be even better at giving that speech than you, right? Like because there's all these extra variables. But that's like one one sort of way of thinking about it, right? Kind of representational knowledge. Um I would trust that if I behaved in a certain way that um, the average random person doesn't understand, but it's consistent with my behavior because it's me, right? That you would be able to explain it in a way that is close to correct, close to close to how I explain it, right? So, and it might even be that my explanation for my behavior is kind of wrong, but you would be able to simulate my explanation. So if that makes sense, it's like you, you, it's like you understand, let like, I me mean, think, I, I guess you can think of me as, think of each person as a character, like in a, in a TV show or in a, you know, whatever. And like your friends, when you understand the characters, motivations, insights, the way they behave, and, and you kind of, you feel like you know them, right? And they know you, right? Well, characters don't know you, but like there's that, there's that sense of, can you trust that person to, to represent you well? And, and you know, I, I talk about about a good reply game on Twitter, right? And the, the essence of good reply game is that you have to hypothesize what you think the person is trying to do, right? When they are, when they make a tweet, like what is the game that they're trying to play? What's the, what's the bit? And there's an act of, of interpretation involved where, again, there's no way of knowing for sure what a person means by what they tweet. You can, you can try and go in a probabilistic sort of way. It's just like most people who say these things usually want a certain thing. And um, if you can read unique bids from someone's utterances based on reference to other utterances they've made or to their bio or to something else that you know about them, some private information, if you accurately read their proposal and you respond in a way that demonstrates that you're accurate understand their proposal then you have a shared understanding and then they will feel like you know them right and uh i have made friends i will I, there, there are like a few people that i think of who are like they are way more famous than me and they have so they have way more um people kind of making demands of their time and energy and attention that you know i consider them my friends even though you know, we haven't spent a ton of time. So we've met. So like like the I, I switched someone from someone that is like a mutual to a friend when we, usually it's when we've met, right? We've met and um we exchanged several moments of shared understanding where the usually the person's like, 
yeah, right, right. Like, like they get that I I get them in a way that other people don't get. And and like they don't have to, they can let some part of their guard down around me, right? Like so earlier in the conversation, I talked about the ways in which, you know, a hero might be interpreted in a certain negative light, right? Um, the way just some things like that. Uh, I do that because we're on a podcast and people who are viewing this or listening to this might not have this the shared context mm-hmm. that we do. Mm-hmm. But I trust that when I say hero, you know that I don't mean yeah. you know, some asshole, right? Like because we have that shared understanding. And so the more of such shared understandings we have, the more friends we are, sort of, in 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 this dimension. Hmm. There's also like, you know, the other dimension of like um, you know, like if you go by love languages, there's like how much time are you willing to spend with someone or how much how much do you give them gifts or do you um I don't know, touch them. Like just there's all these mm-hmm. things, right? And uh I again so different so somebody else might be like, you can't be friends with anyone that you're not meeting regularly, which I don't agree with at all. I feel that some of the greatest friendships in human history have been between people who corresponded by mail, you know, like historically, right? And uh they shared their innermost thoughts mm-hmm. with each other and that friendship is very, very real to me. And so I, I, that's the tradition that I participate in. That's the kind of school of friendship that I believe in. But, and, you know, you can meet, some, there are some people you meet, you've known for years and like, yeah, like everyone assumes you're friends because you're, you grew up together, but like you, ha- you barely respect each other, right? You just kind of coexist. And you would say that they are friends because, you know, it's just easy to, easier that way maybe. But uh, I, I kind of seek a certain higher standard and uh, again, it's just not to dismiss that kind of friendship. So there's many, many kinds of friendship, right? And uh, it's it it's a very nuanced, rich, complex thing. And I, I do think that periodically, I hear from people who who think that uh, you know, if you are trying to be a public figure, then you can only have the assumption. I guess is that you can only have parasocial relationships with people, meaning that people are in love with you or the image of you or the idea of you and you don't respond back and and there are some assumptions there about what their relationship is like um i wouldn't say someone is my friend if i'm not talking to them you know it's like if i'm not personally privately exchanging messages and then having a shared understanding and there are people that i do have a sh- do have some shared understanding with that i don't yet call my friend because we haven't kind of crossed some kind of threshold of of like a mutual mutual understanding but th- there are people that I have very strong instincts that I would be friends with the moment we met. You know, like take um take Nina Colada, right? Like she's she's mm-hmm. someone that we both are mutuals with. Like we haven't met. We haven't we haven't had a had a like a video call. We haven't had a much exchange DMs or whatever. But I just get a sense. I get a sense that if we met, like within 10 minutes, we would be talking like we've known each other for years. Like I I and I have a thread where I do this with every time I meet a Twitter mutual. I I post in that thread and like consistently every single person that I've met in that thread like we became super close afterwards and, and I don't necessarily mean super close as in um, we talk every day or whatever but it's just mm-hmm. I know mm-hmm. that we got each other and like if they need me and again like if they need me what does that mean like if they need my perspective if they need me to stand up for them for something or if they need you know they just there, there, there exists that shared understanding and I and we each have a part of that shared understanding and if they need me to rejoin that space right to re-participate in that shared to kind of reaffirm that shared understanding like it's it's, it's, it's a no-brainer for me to do it it's just it's why I'm alive you know it's like to to inhabit the shared understanding I have with other people like that is kinship even right like again like maybe the word friend is just um I don't know, people have, people draw up all these boundaries about, you know, same for like a date, a lover, boyfriend, girlfriend, like, eh, you know, it's like, it's like what I was talking about earlier about laws and, and, and justice and whatnot. Like people get fixated on, oh, is this past, has this passed the bill or whatever. I'm like, what is this person? Does it matter? You know, like, like okay, I get it. Like people want to know, sure. But um, it's just, I have people that I vibe with and and with the people that I vibe with, we don't doesn't really matter you know, what we call it. Like it's just we have this shared understanding of some kind. We have we might be playing together in some way. You know, we might be riffing back and forth on Twitter. We might be doing other things, maybe. But like um, the 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 label does not really matter to me. Like what what matters to me is the the, the ongoing continuous 
exchange, participation, dance, right? And sometimes it ebbs and flows. Sometimes it, some of my favorite people are people that I speak to like once a year or less, even right? Like, uh, and yeah. <laughs> Good answer. Yeah, shared understanding. It see, it seems like this is um, uh, like one of several instances of a theme that I've been seeing you on about of like the frames that are available by default aren't necessarily very good and include yeah. assumptions that you don't want to take on of like, um, and it seems like that's the case for you with friends is like sh shared understanding is the foundation and it may not need anything other than that. Yeah, yeah, very, very much. So. I, I suspect this is going to be, I'm going to get much more intense about this in the coming, I mean, after, I'm going to finish my current book, but like, you know, everything, happiness, incels, ADHD, body positivity, like almost, it's almost like to be super radical about it. If you have a description for a problem and that problem has not been going away over time, that problem has not been, progress has not been made in solving the problem, the war on drugs, whatever, if that problem is persisting, mm -hmm. despite mm -hmm. having a description for the problem, there is a good chance, I believe, that the descriptor of the problem is playing a role, whether intentionally or not, in perpetuating the problem. Because it's likely that you know you might be conflating symptoms with causes, right? Like, um, yeah, you know, it's, I wouldn't be surprised if like uh, loneliness. Um, it's just everything is wrong, you know. It's just the, the way people talk about things is wrong. And you, if if there's a problem and you're trying to describe it, and you haven't been able to solve it, it's chances are you're you're focusing on the wrong thing, right? So I'll, I'll talk about like incels, right? The 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 it's crazy that the phrase incel has become the word. It's become so ubiquitous. So like the idea of incel is involuntary celibate, right? So I I I'm not having sex and I don't have a choice in it. I didn't. It's it's not my fault. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not choosing to not have sex. I just can't. Like, nobody wants to have sex with me. I'm an involuntary celibate. And then, so I'm an incel. And that's what they, how they choose to define themselves. They make it an identity. And shockingly to me, the rest of the world has accepted that label as as the descriptor of this, this political entity. And then you're like, oh yeah, he's such an incel. And it's like, you, do you see what's happening? It's like it's encoded in the phrase that the problem is the lack of sex, but that's like downstream. The problem is a lack of a, the, the inability to relate to other people intimately. Right? Like sex is 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 not. I mean, like it's like um, you know, uh, there's this great blog post by this, and it's something like, uh, we. When a couple fights about the dishes, like a married couple is fighting about the dishes, it's never about the dishes. Nobody gives a fuck about dishes, right? They're fighting about the dishes because somebody feels like a boundary has been violated. Somebody feels disrespected. Somebody feels that their partner promised them they were going to do something and they can't trust their partner, right? That's the problem. The problem isn't the dishes. The problem is I can't trust you. Or the problem is I feel like you don't respect me. Like those are the real problems. And it's like, when we use, so it's like what I'm saying is like, it's like, imagine if people think that a couple fighting about the dishes should be described in terms of those dishes. You know what I mean? It's like the dishes are not the problem. The dishes are just the domain in which this, the, the battlefield in which this war is being fought. But that it's, it's not the battlefield's fault. You know, it's not the battlefield's responsibility. And if you fixate on the battlefield instead of the warring parties and their their needs, their their hopes, their confusions, their anxieties, their their beliefs, like then you're never gonna make progress. It's it's almost designed to keep you there. And yeah, you know, so such is the case with uh, so many. Like when you start looking for it, and I'm gonna I'm I, I might get to doing more of this in the coming. I gotta share my book first, though, but like yeah, when you start looking at it. You know, again, like ADHD, what does it mean when you, like pe people, people use it as a phrase and eventually it kind of becomes a word, but like it become, becomes just kind of a, like, you know, BFGF. You don't really think about what it means. Like it's just, it's just a, a signifier. But if you dig into it, it's like attention deficit um, hyperactivity disorder. It's like, like what you don't have enough attention. Like, you know, it's, it's not, when you really dig into it, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't describe the problem correctly. And like one of the things I learned from Dinesh, like and is in general, is like if you want to solve a problem, you have to describe it correctly. Like you have to know what the problem actually is. The problem was never the dishes, you know, the problem was never the lack of sex. The problem was like, yeah, it might 
it might help if you did the bloody dishes, right? But there's a reason you're not doing the dishes. And, and so it's, it's all these things upstream. The upstream is the real problem. And, and so it's, it's crazy, right? It's like, again, like, I feel like people have a loneliness and belonging problem. And I feel like I solved it for myself. And it's just so wild how everything's connected because then it's like, it seems to me like it might be possible that a large amount of suffering in the world is downstream of people just using the wrong words. That's that's insane. If that's true, it's like it's all. I almost feel. I feel like I feel like I have to whisper because it's like it's it seems so outrageous. <laughs> if like oh guys, guess what? We've been using the wrong words. That's, that's that's why we have disagreements. It's like you know it's that. And then I mean, if you dig into it, it's like people don't want like large swaths of the populations are committed to fighting because they don't want to understand each other because they want to express their anger and blah, blah, blah. But like, you know, if we start with trying to help the people who want to be helped, right? The people who, the people who used to describe themselves as incels but no longer feel that way or feel conflicted about their identity and they want to explore it. And then you'd be like, hey, why don't we try using different words, right? Why don't we try focusing on, you know, like, so one of the questions I get a lot is how do I not be a failure? And I'm like, stop using that word. You know, stop defining mm-hmm, yourself mm-hmm. In terms of I am a failure, how do I be less of a failure? It doesn't is because even if you reduce your failure rate by 90%, you're still thinking of yourself as a failure. Like the problem is still there. You have to instead think of your think, how can I succeed at something? What will a success look like to me? Can you and a person say I don't trust myself? I'm like, okay, can you pour yourself a glass of water and can you drink it? Like, can you trust yourself to pour yourself a glass of water right now and drink it? And they'll be like, yeah, I'm like, do that. Do that right now while you're talking to me on the phone or whatever. Go and get a glass of water. I'll wait here for you. Go and get a glass, go and get a glass of water. Drink it. Then they're like, okay. And, and say, say before you go, I trust myself to pour myself a glass of water. I trust myself to keep myself hydrated, right? Like right now. Like, and they do it. And then you're like, you just, you just trusted yourself and you did something. You did something you said you were going to do and you did it. You are now a person who, at least for this one act, are trustworthy, right? You have succeeded at this one thing. What's another thing you can succeed at? And then you move on to the next thing. And then it's like, you know, how do I become, how do I do succeed at more and more things? And, and then like you increase that. And then you, you, you inhabit that frame for three months, six months, a year. And you've just, you've forgotten that you used to define yourself as a failure. And you try, trying to be less of a failure is like trying to not think of an elephant. It's, it's just, you, too late. I'm thinking of the elephant now. Fuck, lost. Like, you know, I mean, you. so this is why my bio says focus on what you want to see more of because you can never get less of what you want by focusing on it. It's like, and it's like, it, it does seem like a lot of, a lot of, let me close the dog. It does seem like, again, I don't want to be, I don't want to project um, assumptions about other people's motives. But if you look at the incentives, it does seem like a lot of the media apparatus is incentivized to perpetuate problems because problems just encourage more conversation more yelling more arguments more fighting like it would be a bad day for news if like people are just oh breaking news people all over the world are like solving all their problems like you know it's like it's uh but you know so again we, we probably won't get to that at a massive scale anytime soon but there is a path to that which is like we start with we start with the exceptional people and who have the capacity to do it and you know, we find more people, help more people, and it does seem like we I don't know, we'll see. There there may be some bottlenecks that I'm I'm at my present position unable to perceive, but I do think that if there was ever gonna be a generation that would be the first to kind of solve problems at a global scale, like we have the media technology for it, we have the comms technology for it, we have maybe not us, maybe it's our our some of our descendants, like maybe our kids, grandkids, great grandkids, but it it does seem like potential has opened up that wasn't available until until smartphones. I would say I got to write that essay. There's there's a there's something about smartphones that again a lot of people are terrified of this 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 how it it can destroy us, but it's like Pandora's box, right? Like underneath all of the the horrible things that come out, there's hope at the bottom of it, and. Uh, I don't know, maybe maybe there's too binary thinking of it in terms of like um you know saving the world or or keeping the world from being destroyed or whatever. But like, you know, maybe it's just for thousands more years, people are just gonna keep living their lives. But like we can we can be the 
we can be part of the legacy of the people who tried to make it better. Like, I think that's if, you know, if, if at worst, if at least that's all that our lives come to, like if we don't succeed at anything. And so the only thing we've done is be a part of the people who tried. Like, I'm, I'm okay with that. I made my peace with that. But like, wonderfully, I'm already seeing as there's so much good that we can do for other people. So it's, ah, uh, but yeah, language, words, how we use them, you know, happy, like people, the the pursuit of happiness is another phrase that I'm like, I wonder sometimes if it's like designed to be self-defeating and like keep you in this, this loop of always chasing a thing that you cannot get. But maybe it's just when they first said it, they meant something different and then, you know, meanings evolve. And so because meanings evolve, we need people who function as like shaman in a sense to kind of recreate and rediscover things from first, like from basics, like really think through everything, use different words, re-explore, rediscover the, the, the sacred quality of things. Hmm. Is there anything that feels uh, adjacent to anything that we've talked about that you want to bring up or mention or reflect on before we close? Um, I guess I just want to generally encourage people. Like, so if anyone's listening and they're still they're still listening, like two hours in, like, wow, thanks for hanging out. And uh, I just I want to I, I feel like I already try to be an encouraging person in general, and I feel like I could do it more. Like, I just just telling people that hey, you know, you matter. And uh, you you can if if you don't currently feel like like you're doing much or whatever like it's okay you know you can you you can start a journey at any point in time in your life you can have a spiritual awakening at any point you can you can be non spiritual it's fine it doesn't matter it's just you know it's however you want to frame it whatever words you want to use you can be a nourishing presence for someone else right you can take care of someone else you can. And again, take care might sound like it's a very dramatic, like, oh, I'm going to be their parent or whatever. But you can just be, say a nice word to a friend. Send send a meme to, go through your contact list and look for someone that you can send a meme to and tell them that you're thinking about them. You know, just help people feel less alone. Say nice things. Give compliments to people. Just just be this 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 nourishing presence in the world. And, you know, it's like, it's it's it makes no sense that we live in a world with technology allowing us to, connect all the time and, and people are reporting increased loneliness it makes no sense we we can fix that we can teach each other to do better we can you know send your friends memes at the very least send your friends memes let them know you're thinking of them right like let people feel less alone and in that in that you can develop a shared understanding with your friends eh? 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 <laughs> and and yeah you know send your friends memes develop a shared understanding ask them how they're doing ask them what's been on their mind you know Take care of each other. That's why we're here. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Fiza. I really enjoyed this conversation and I'm really pleased with the, the, the things that we discussed. So thank you so much for your time. Cheers, man. It's fun. <laughs>